Today's episode of the Cured Collective podcast is with my brother, Jay Frugia. Jay has been representing Cured since the very beginning. Jay was actually uh, one of the individuals that invited um, myself onto his podcast to share my story into starting this company. So super excited to have Jay on for now the second time. If you don't know, Jay Frugia is a coach to high performers, whether it be businessmen and women, whether it be athletes, you name it, he coaches individuals to unlock their full potential, even though they already are high performers. It takes individuals like Jay to keep them operating at the highest level of performance, and that is what he does. I always love talking to Jay about what his life looks like. Uh, We talked about what the last year with COVID and a couple moves for himself have been like for himself and his wife, Jen. And we dove into his ideas and beliefs and teachings around leadership. I truly enjoy sitting down with Jay every single time. I appreciate him. Somebody that I've always looked to as a leader and studied over the course of my health and fitness career. And I know you all are going to enjoy this episode. We appreciate him and his representation of Cured. And without further ado, Jay Frugia. All right. Jay, thanks for joining me today, brother. It's good to have you back on for the second time. But you've seen you've seen my entire journey since the beginning of Cured. And it's been an honor to have you along the ride. So it's, it's good to have you here on the podcast again. Pleasure, man. Always good to see you. Yeah. I want to just ask you a couple things because the last time I talked to you, it was before the mess of 2020. But when I saw you in Santa Monica before, it was literally right before everything started shutting down. Oh, was it? Right was it like before. February or March we were, or something? Yeah, we were because we were there for Expo West. Yeah. That shut down. We were going to go from Expo West to the Arnold. The Arnold shut down and then everything shut down. But right. I remember asking you how you were doing and you, you, you said the best I've ever been. And I was like, fuck that, like, just gives me the chills because it makes me so happy for you. Um, but it's also like, you know, makes, brings so much curiosity, like what yeah. defines you being the best you've ever been. And I know we haven't talked too much over the last year, but curious if you're still riding that. And I know you've had a lot of transitions moving to Austin, moving to Miami, but I want to just start there. Ask, ask about you and your life and, and how you're doing. Yeah, I appreciate it. I mean, I guess I'm not still riding that high because, <laughs> well, like you said, right after the whole world fell apart. So uh, I think probably like yourself, like people who are, you know, into personal development and, and being disciplined and having routines and stuff. I can confidently say that I handled 2020 better than a lot of people did. Yeah. Uh, that said, I still, you know, I'm still human. I still got sucked into a lot of stuff. Like during 2020, I definitely was on social media more than I've ever been. I was uh, watching the news. I mean, dude, I hadn't watched the news in years, but I got sucked into watching the news all the time. See what the hell was going on. Uh, not only with COVID, but then when George Floyd happened and all that, it was like, oh man, it's just crazy. So you know, that being said, I am human. I, I got sucked into some, some, some rabbit holes. And, uh, but I think having the personal discipline and being like, okay, like, you know, reading stoicism and embracing some of those philosophies, like control what you can control. Um, you know, we're home, shit's shut down. What are you going to do? Uh, you got to have your routines every day. So, you know, get up, train, read, eat well, all these things. Uh, I think that helped me a lot. And then just, you know, each day kind of figuring out how to navigate it. Uh, and then also realizing too, that it wasn't about me. It was about, uh, I know that, like I said, I can confidently say, and not that that sounds egotistical. I'm just confident in that fact that I was doing better than a lot of people were. So I had a lot of friends in the area. I mean, you know, I know half the people in LA. So I would, once I got over being stressed out, like what is going on with the world? I'd be like, all right, let me meet up with this person. Let me go out. Let's, let's go train on the beach or whatever was open, what we could do, connect with other people and kind of bring some some levity and some light and some humor to their lives. And, and that no matter what year it is, what day it is, what's going on in the world, if you're always just focused on yourself, then you know, you're always going to be anxiety ridden, stressed out, bummed out. So the more you can get out and try to make other people feel better, you're always going to feel better anyway. Yeah. Create the connection of, man, 
we all can go down some rabbit holes and have some crazy thoughts and that's part of being human and yeah so how are we still going to take care of yourself uh, take care of ourselves to take care of each other because sometimes that's what we need to do is you know pick up a little bit of more energy from those of us around us to help them get through the difficult times i think that that's i think that i think that that's a really just important concept from this last year is like we had to we had to focus on what we could control and that was our daily practices to keep us grounded to keep us centered and to keep us focused on our missions uh but you know we had to we had to lend a lot of hands over this last year to the people that needed it and rightfully so um i think that it's interesting to me um it took a long time and i you know have seen you talk about it too but it just took so long for and i it's not it's still not happening at the mass level where it should be happening where you know we have the mainstream media and we have the channels that distribute the information of what we should be doing right now in this global pandemic but the conversations of being finding what it is that makes us thrive and the foundation of that being our sleep our nutrition our movement and that all affecting our immune system the way that we can experience difficult times build resilience but also build resilience from an immune standpoint like those conversations just took way too long to be blasted on a mass. I know, you know, in your space, in the health and wellness and fitness space, the personal development space, there's a lot of people talking about it over this last year, but these information silos were just so dangerous. And it seemed like, I know it seemed like there was, I don't know, like March to probably July, August, you know, after all the riots and everything is you literally couldn't get a message out there that, the mess that needed to be heard because it was yeah. somebody was afraid of being canceled or why aren't you talking about this or it was just like wow like i know all these people that have such good hearts and want people to win and want people to feel their best and that's their base intention behind everything they do but if they didn't say the right thing at the right time they'd be yelled at i'm just like man what is going on <laughs> yeah i know i thought i thought it was just an epic failure at a, at a global scale that we didn't have those conversations like okay this is the time over a million people die. I forget the exact numbers, like 600,000, let's say it is from, from, from cancer, 700,000 from, from uh, diabetes, somewhere in that same number from obesity each year. And no one's ever talked about that. And like, so, so here was a time, okay, there's a global pandemic. There's a health crisis. Let's start talking about how to get people healthy. Why is that not le the leading story on the news every night? Mm -hmm. Why are we not teaching people to exercise, to get sunlight, to get vitamin D, to eat well, to sleep, to practice uh, breathing techniques, to do all this stuff. No, 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 none of that. None of that. I, the first person I saw on, on TV to talk about it at all was Bill Maher. And I was like, wow, at least somebody's talking about it. And he's got a big audience. He's great. But nobody would talk about it. Yeah. And it was crazy. I just thought it was the biggest epic failure of all time. Yeah. And social media algorithms could have been set up like in a different way like let's you know like there's no way that we can change technology in the way that things worked especially through social media but it was just like the the wrong things were getting silenced and yeah couldn't speak up and it, it was just it was just a wild time how was so you moved in the middle of the pandemic basically when did you move to austin uh, we, we, we moved, uh, in, uh, December. So it had been a while. Yeah. We, we yeah. were trying to, we were looking for a place all around LA and then basically all over Southern Cali for like nine months. We couldn't find anywhere. And we're just like, ah, maybe this is a sign. Let's leave LA for a while. Yeah. And I know you're, you know, you had so much of your heart there in LA. I remember speaking to you after just, after I was never leaving. Left. I was never leaving. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and the community, the just, I mean, probably mostly the community. Yeah, um, that was it. And so, yeah, what was, what's the, now two moves, now off to Miami after Austin, what's that been like uprooting, you know, your life twice, essentially? I know you have a community in Austin as well, uh, but, you know, you spent, you built such a, such a life there in Los Angeles. What was that transition like for you? 
Yeah, I don't know. It was really hard. Like I, I left Jersey after 36 years and I was like, whatever. I didn't shed a tear, nothing. I, I was couldn't wait to get out of there, you know. Yeah. But after 10 years in L.A., I mean, I cried my eyes out for days. It was like and people are like, well, you don't have to leave, which I, I, I didn't have to, of course. But I don't know. It just seemed like that was the direction I was being pointed in to go. And a lot of things, you know, any, anyone knows right now, L.A. is a shit show. So uh, we moved. And in retrospect, I, I still think it was a good idea. Like, I didn't love my time in Austin. I was coming from living on the beach, mm-hmm. um, you know, the whole the whole thing there. And I just didn't love just, you know, the weather, the vibe, the whole thing. It wasn't my time. It's a great place. Like, don't get me wrong. Austin's great. But I wasn't, I wasn't loving it. Um, and I did realize that even though I had a, a community of people there, like I didn't have my really close friends there. And man, that that was hard to deal with. Honestly, that was the hardest thing uh, for me because I'm like you said, I'm all about like community and like always having people over for games or whatever it is. And uh, so not having that really impacted me a lot. So I, I started getting a little bit bummed out there. So that's why we decided to move to Miami. Uh, close, my closest friend for 30 years lives here. So just ha- you know. You could be with your closest friend, like in a cardboard box and in a horrible place. And it's awesome, you know? Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so I mean, it's been, it's, it's been crazy. It, it, honestly, there are still days, well, probably every day that I miss Cali and that I think back and, you know, that was the best 10 years of my life. I don't know how it's going to pan out, uh, but you always want to stay positive and be like, all right, well, how, how can I, you know, create something special here? And, I, I think the thing, if I'm being honest, in Austin was like after two months being there, I was like, we're not going to stay here. So mm-hmm. I didn't do all the things I do going out, trying to build relationships. Like, so, sure. you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, uh, before we hopped on, I, I shared that I wanted to speak to you about leadership. And I, I really wanted to, you know, as, as someone who is called upon and looked to, to help coach high performing individuals, whether it be in business, in sports, high performing teams, and, you know, really just this underlying through line of unlocking people's potential, unlocking performance and being a, you know, a high performing coach, really what a lot of this comes down to is like two forms of leadership and like, or I guess it's, leadership in of itself, but you can't be the leader of an organization, a team, whatever it may be, a family without first being able to lead yourself. And so I wanted to ask you in a process in which, you know, say a company's coming, uh, coming to you and saying, Hey, Jay, we're, we're trying to work on, you know, taking our organization to the next level. I I know I've spoken to you about some of your, some of the companies that you work with in the past. And um, I really want to just try to understand the approach that you take with high performers, high performing teams, companies that have high potentials to really develop leadership skills and maybe even start to uncover dysfunctions first and foremost to then build the leadership skills in the future. So when a company comes to you or a high performing individual comes to you and, and, you know, you're there to consult them on a performance type basis, how do you, how do you approach that type of a um, working relationship and consulting slash coaching position? So let's backtrack to COVID because you said something there is important. You know, you can't lead others if you can't leave yourself. So when the world is falling apart around us during COVID, uh, you have to be like, holy shit. And this is, this is what I did. Like, oh my God, all the things I tell people not to do now, I'm starting to do. I'm getting trapped uh, watching the news, you know, connected to social media, all this kind of stuff. So at, at some point you need to pull yourself out of that. And everyone had to make that decision for themselves. And I, and I saw people who I thought were leaders and were strong, powerful people kind of falling apart, you know, like by, by June, July. And you're like, man, you have to make that decision. You got to take it upon yourself. If everyone's falling apart around you, what are you going to do? I mean, if there's a zombie apocalypse, somebody has to step up and be the leader. You know, when it, when things go wrong, when things go south, somebody has to choose to be the leader. I want that always to be me. Leadership is a choice. It's not a gift. You know, maybe the ability to, to dunk is, is a gift and, and, you know, the ability to play basketball like Kobe or Michael Jordan. But leadership is a choice and it's a choice you make every day. And but just by every action you take, it's a choice. So 
So when I found myself slipping and I see people around me, I'm like, oh my God, what am I doing? I'm the leader. I, I got to get out in my community, lead. I got to lead people online, my you know, uh, clients, whatever it might be. So that's really the main thing is every day you get up and you decide, am I going to be a leader or not? And it's not that once you're a leader, you're always a leader. It's every single day. Like once you get in shape, if you never train again, you're going to be in shit shape in six months. You know, if you got to shower every day, like all these things are a choice or you're not going to be a leader. It's not something that you maintain. So every single decision, every choice, you know, what time you get up, what you do with your morning routine, what you eat. Uh, how you train, you know, how you treat people, whatever, your ability to make faster decisions. So you always got to check yourself and, and look at yourself in the mirror. And am I acting like a leader? And sometimes it's draining. You know, sometimes you're like, I want to make every decision for everybody, but you have to. Nobody's good. It's as simple as if you're with five friends and they go, oh, where should we eat tonight? You don't go, I don't, I don't know. What do you want to do? Like you have to, like the, the, the qual one of the main qualities of a leader is you have to be decisive. You have to make fast decisions, mm -hmm. you know, uh, like, like Colin Powell's rule. You only need, uh, uh, 40% and no more than 70% of all the information to make a good decision. And then you can course correct if needed, but all these things like, Hey, what do you want to watch tonight? Oh, let's watch the Wu-Tang documentary. Uh, wh where do you want to go eat tonight? Oh, let's go to uh Smith and Wilson, Wh whatever. Like you got to make decisions fast. And I think that in itself, it's, it sounds small. But that's training you on a regular basis to be a better leader, is to just make faster decisions, you know. Um, and then also decision fatigue is a real thing. So yeah. you need to limit the amount of decisions you make all day. That's why certain people will wear the same things over and over. That's why they'll eat the same meals. Like I always tell clients, eat the same, like eat the same meals three, five times a day, whatever works for you. Eat that repeatedly every day. 365 days a year and then you actually it, it, from a from a physique standpoint and a health standpoint it becomes easier to not have to weigh and measure your macros and that shit all the time if, if that's not something you're into because it's like okay you know you have eggs and oatmeal for breakfast bison and rice two meals a day and a protein shake and, and cereal after training then okay if you're not gaining weight add a little bit more than one or two of those meals if you're not losing weight take a little well, like it's super super simple you know so you need to yeah. simplify everything in your life and just make faster decisions. Um, now I feel like I'm going to rant and, and forgot the original question, but yeah, <laughs> no, you're talking about, no, go ahead. I, well, I was going to say, yeah, that's, I mean, that's the foundation of really the question. And I, and I wanted to ask a, a follow on to that was like, how do you perform a self audit? How do you teach people to perform an audit of themselves? And then, you know, I think that I would assume that within leadership development, that's one of the most important steps is the audit, the audit phase and like the actual like, hey, like, let's be real, like, let's be real of like what might be going wrong here and let's be real of where we need to step up. But that's a kind of a twofold question is like performing a self audit. How do you do that? Then how do you coach others through that situation? Yeah. So, so every morning is super simple. I just write in the five minute journal and then I write it at night. And one of my things is I am a great leader. So I just write that every day and believe that and, you know, go live into that. Um, and then at night kind of do a recap, right? Um, I lost my train of thought there for a second, but, 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 and, oh, and then, so, so how do I go about my day? You know, do I do the thing? Do I keep the promises to myself that I've made? You know, did I, you know, I, I have daily non-negotiables, which I think are important. Did I keep those or did I break those? And then if I broke those, I broke a promise to myself, my self-esteem suffers. I'm not as good of a leader. So I, I always ask people to create a list. I know I'm jumping around here, but, but I always ask people to create a list um, of not five things that you love to do, but five things that you hate not doing. Because mm -hmm. you and I could probably sit here like, I'm super excited about a lot of stuff and passion and I think everything's great. So my list of the things that I would love to do would be 987 things. But the things that I hate not doing is like five for most people it's probably like seven things like it's not not exercising not eating well uh not listening to hip-hop all day uh not spending <laughs> two hours outside uh not laughing and not spending time with people i love like it's maybe five or six things that's it that's my whole list of things that i hate not doing like if i get to the end of the day and i didn't do those things i will be bummed out i've let myself down i can't be as good of a leader but if i do all those things then i could be better for everyone. Like if I've done most of those things, by the time we get on this podcast, I could be more focused and present and better for you and better here. I could be a better husband. I could be a better friend. When I go meet my friend at the gym, I'm not distracted. I'm not let down on myself. Um, 
And then when, when I'm working with people, I, I can lead. But if you don't do all these things and you create all this anxiety for yourself uh, because you're unhappy with yourself because you broke these promises, it's hard to be a good leader. It's hard to be a good anything because you're just stress ridden and bummed out all the time. So I think that's uh, th that shift is a game changer where Definitely. you create that list of five to seven things that you hate not doing. That's something you have to do because, again, you have to take care of yourself first. You have to lead yourself first. Get in the ritual of doing those things all the time. And now, now you just carry yourself differently. Like your energy is different. You walk into a room. I mean, there's, there's, there's two options. You walk into a room, you positively affect the energy or you negatively affect the energy. Or you're just non-existent, which is horrible too. Like, like all, uh, half of my friends are pro wrestlers and, and clients of mine. The worst thing you could be is the crowd's just not into you. You either want the crowd to absolutely love you or absolutely hate. You. If they just, if you have, it's called go away heat. Like that's the worst. Yeah. So when you walk into a room, you should change the energy of that room. You should come in like, People should be excited to see you popping up, giving you hugs, smiling, all that. And the only way you do that is if you, like I said, you've kept those promises yourself, you love yourself, you're happy about yourself. And then what you can do is you, you start to act completely differently. Like the self-help industry will tell you to think your way into acting differently. Just act your way into thinking differently. Like decide mm -hmm. tomorrow. Like I said, it's a decision. Decide tomorrow. Okay, I'm a leader. I'm high energy. I own a room. Uh, you know, picture somebody who does that and then maybe live like that. Okay, I'm going to walk into a room like I'm the rock. Because if you sit there and read 80 self-help books and listen to every podcast on it, like I'm there, like it's going to take five years. Just do it tomorrow. Tomorrow, when people say, hey, what do you want to do? You make the decision. Just make the choice to be a leader. And I've seen it happen over and over again with coaching clients and people that I work with where they're like, oh, yeah. I, and I, so I'll challenge people. We just had an event and I will challenge people on day one First thing in the morning, I say, I want everyone in this room to be different. And I'll give them some specific examples by lunchtime. And I want you to be different by dinner time tonight. And I want to see you different tomorrow and by dinner tomorrow night. And, and it was crazy that, that like, like one of our guys, Leonard, who I, I love, he's one of, one of my favorite guys. He was the MVP of the weekend because he, at the end of the weekend, I was like, dude, you're a completely different person. Like you're leading, you're so much more confident in 48 hours. He's like, I just sat back, I listened to what you said, and I, I, I accepted the challenge, and I did it. And it's amazing. Like, I'm getting goosebumps right now thinking about it. It's amazing to see people do that. So sometimes I think it's just, um, you know, making them aware of that possibility. Because people might think, well, I'm not a leader. It's going to take years. No, dude, it could take five minutes. Like, if, literally, you could just flip the switch. It's, it's uh, <clears throat> I shared the story with you when I was on your podcast years ago about when I was really depressed and there was this version of who I was on a day-to-day -day basis and the version of who I thought I was. And there was this huge dissonance between the two. And I couldn't speak to it clearly back then, but now that I look, on, look back on telling that story, it's the concept of integrity. It's like, this is who I say I am, but this is actually who I am. And those were out of alignment. And you know what you're speaking to, I think is so... I think people look at changing their lives and it just seems impossible. Yeah. It's like, where do I start? Like I, like the list of things I want to change is like, shit, this is a massive list of things. Where do I start? But you speak to making a promise to yourself. Maybe it's literally like, <clears throat> you know, habit stacking is real. And as you've stacked more and more, you, you have a, you have a higher capacity, but if it's the, concept of like I want to see a physical change in you over the course of a day or two it's like I pushed in the chairs when I got up from the table and I'm proud of like how I created that organization and I said I was going to do that I, I did I took that rep I did the rep of accountability to myself I built this micro confidence and the next day I wake up and I do it again and I do it again and I do it again and you're building that confidence muscle muscle and trust in yourself and I think that I don't think enough of us trust ourselves to make those to make those decisions on a daily basis and understand how over the course of time that micro discipline over the course of a long time literally turns into your life looking completely different from what it used to. But it starts with that it really does. Tiny yeah. Run. yeah, I agree. Yeah, I mean, because the the greatest way to fail is to try to change seventeen things at once. You know, like right. yeah, if you, if you just change those small things. Like I have a few clients who are trying to lose a decent amount of weight right now. And I'm not trying to get them on like, uh, you know, flex wheelers, pre-contest diet or anything. It's like, 
hey, at the end of the week, did you do, you know, did you eat sugar and shitty food you know, significantly less than you did the week before? We'll kind of just keep it simple like that. And uh, I, I think that's the best way to go about anything. It's just small changes and doing one thing at a time. Yeah. You know, if, you get up, if you get up a half hour earlier, if you, you know, cut out one thing out of your diet or something like that. Yeah. Cause you're speaking to, there's a endless list of self-help books out there. And if you try to absorb them all at once, or you're the person that goes to conference after conference, after conference, you're literally just stuck in the self-development loop, but you don't give yourself time to actually implement uh, John Maxwell. Yeah. I'm not sure if you're familiar with John Maxwell, but yeah. You know, he just posted a picture the other day. It said, be a book doer rather than a book reader. So like read the book and then like do what it actually yeah. says in it. Cause you're going to cause yourself anxiety if you don't actually implement. I know, you know, I know so many people and I've had coaching clients that are, and I, I could always identify cause I've been there and you might be able to relate too. is like, uh, I tell them, dude, I, I've been down that same road. You're obsessed with personal development and it's actually having a negative effect. It's ruining your life. You yeah. can't focus on anything else. You're not taking action. You're overwhelmed because you don't know what you should be doing. Um, and I don't know who, who I originally heard say this, but it was uh, read 10 books. That shit, it actually might be as old as, um, uh, I mean, Epictetus said something like this. So I, I don't remember the exact quote, but that, you know, that was forever ago. Uh, not to read a zillion books, like just read a few books and master them. So I remember somebody said, instead of reading hundreds of books, which I've done, and there's no possible way you can remember all that stuff, is read 10 books 10 times. Like if you did that, if you took 10 really powerful books on probably similar subjects, because it's hard for any human being to be an expert at 10 different things, probably similar things, you know, um, and you read them 10 times, my God, like every company in the world would hire you. You could be the, like the most impressive, smartest person. So that's one thing I've done is I don't really buy a ton of new books anymore. You know, if it's a friend or it's something that you're super excited about, yeah. uh, I'll get that. But I, I try to just reread certain books. And especially like if, if, if I get hired to work with a team or a company or something like that, or I have an event coming up, there's literally like no more than 10 books that for the month before I'll just go through my highlights. I'm not going through my whole bookshelf, you know? Yeah. It might, it might, it might only be five actually. Yeah. I'm curious, Jay. So when I, when I look to you and I watch you, I see somebody who gives a lot. And, you know, when you were you're sharing the, the story of uh, the individual that you're working with and it, it gives you goosebumps, and I think it gives you goosebumps because you see, I think you, you, you know what it feels like to give to somebody and see change in them and how much that fulfills you compared to other things that are potentially materialistic or just like, let's only focus on numbers from a monetary perspective. And like, that's how I measure success in my life. Has that one, I'm curious if that lands, but two, has that evolved over the course of your business and leadership life so uh, see yeah you i mean you're exactly right seeing somebody else like seeing leonard succeed or seeing anyone that you work with succeed uh that always makes me happier than, than anything that i could do like anything that i could achieve any any amount of money that i could make and for years i thought um like i happen to be uh uh walker bueller is a, a great pitcher for the dodgers right now and i worked with him one-on-one -on -one when he was uh in the minors and, you know, we just worked on mindset stuff and discipline and habits and just random coincidence. I happened to be there at Dodger Stadium during his debut. We were sitting there in the stands and I just come back in the bathroom and, and he came in as relief in relief in the ninth inning. And uh, they're like making his uh, major league debut. Walker Buehler was like, oh, my God, it's amazing. And I'm here for that. That he made. And now he's one of, you know, great, great pitcher. Uh, but they didn't even think he was going to make it. So I was working on him to you know overcome some self-limiting belief. But I was so happy and so proud of him. And, you know, there's so many instances like that where I'm so happy and so proud of friends. And I used to think, is that something wrong with me? You know, is my self, is there something weird about that? But then every high performer that I know and everyone who, who performs in front of people who's on stage, who's a pro athlete or whatever, you know, you always hear, heard about like Kobe, as soon as he won a championship, he goes, all right, what's next? Uh, so I don't, I don't think it's, it's something that's wrong with me. I think you're actually living a better life that way. Like when you're just giving and you're focusing on other people and their success means more to you than your own success. I, I think you're just, you're just going to be happier and more fulfilled that way. Like you're saying. 
Yeah. In the, I think it was in the last, in the last dance. Um, so good. So good. So good. And I think it's probably a similar trait for Kobe too, but I think maybe a little bit, I think they're a little bit different in this, but um, the interviewer was, was asking, and this is going to be specific to, to high performers and leaders of companies, but like the interviewer was asking Michael or saying like, Hey, like I feel as though it seems as though people think you're an asshole and he cries and stops the interview. And I heard somebody else speak to this on a podcast, but they kind of, they reflected that when you're a high performer and you, you hold other people to a line or hold other people to a very high standard, one that weighs a lot on you. Like that's not an easy job, but sometimes it's so hard for uh, others around an individual like that to understand that that's the true intention. And I think that that's what was uh, interesting to see in the last dance. And, you know, kind of, I, I just got done reading, reading uh, winning um, by Tim Grover, but I think that there's this idea of like these, the high performing individual, whether it be within a business or on a sports team has this extreme amount of discipline and that extreme amount of discipline can almost make you feel within your head, like you're crazy. Like, like, I think we all have aspects of that, but I think that you, you would probably reflect the same as like, you'd like to achieve, you'd like to see progress, but being able to bring the team with you and being able to bring those individuals with you around you is a whole nother level of, of, I guess, kind of, it's an attribute, like you, to be that person, to bring those people along, to call those people forward takes a lot. Um, I'm curious if what you think about that, like Michael Jordan as the high performer, Kobe as the high performer, the way he pushed people around him and the way that that can be perceived potentially wrongly by individuals within a team that are, you know, underperforming or might not be, you know, I'm just curious what yeah. thoughts about that. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that's challenging, um, you know, to reach that level, you have to be like that, you know, you, you have to be like that and you have to have kind of that, that black heart and, and be able to do that kind of stuff. And, you know, was it, did Michael Jordan want Scotty and, and Charles Oakley and all those guys to perform because he would be so proud of them and be happy of them? Probably not. He just wanted to win the championship. You know what I mean? So yeah. it, there's there's different levels to it um i i think very few people like i would love to sit here and say oh yeah i have the exact same color killer instinct as michael does i think if everyone had that we would all be you know nba champions or whatever it is like that's a one in a million kind of go or guy kobe's a one in a million kind of guy um and 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 honestly knowing some people like that and, and studying them reading biographies you know watching documentaries most of those people don't have many if any close relationships so you 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 decide you know what you want and you make those sacrifices um if you're working with people in, in an organization or a team and there's someone who's like that like who has that that black mamba or that that jordan mentality um that that's tough you know to, to pull that person aside and be like i mean the, the best you can do is is kind of teach them or or hope to teach them to have some empathy and be like look you you know, and, and you gotta not that not that sandwich praise is good. You know, sandwich praise is like Joe. You did such a great job at that meeting the other day, but you totally blew it when we talked to that other guy. Like you know, like Greg Popovich does a great like they talk about good leaders will um, always you know, like relationships are first and foremost. So that's, I think let me backtrack a little. If you're gonna talk to anybody in any organization about anything, the first thing you need, need to do is be really good at building relationships. You need to have really good people skills and relationship skills. So when I would go anywhere to do anything, the first thing I'm going to do is build relationships and build relationships before I get there, you know, via, via, via email, via text, via social media, uh, study on the person. Like when the Dodgers first brought me in, I knew I was meeting Gabe Kapler, who's now the, um, uh, the manager of the San Francisco Giants. So I, I read up on Gabe. I knew who Gabe was for years, but I found uh, all the things that he and I had in common. He was a Tupac fan. He loves Dr. King. Great. We got him, he loves Eminem. Uh, all these things that he's into, awesome. We have all these things to talk about. So we get there before we even talk about business. 
That's what we're talking about. For an hour, we're just hitting it off. So you always want to build relationships and establish that you're a good person that cares, you know, establish co uh, commonalities and things like that, make people laugh. Humor is, is one of the most important things. I mean, laughter is the fundament, the number one fundamental sign of uh, connection is safety. Like people feel safe when they're laughing. So any organization, you always want to laugh. That's why I think improv is huge and important. Um, so so you're, we're building relationships. Now people know that they, they know, like, and trust you. They'll be more likely to take feedback from you. Uh, again, Greg Popovich is someone like, like that, I, that I always talk about who's really great at this, the, the coach of the Spurs for years, because he will build really close relationships with everybody. He knows their favorite wine. He knows their favorite restaurant. He knows their kids' birthdays. He knows all these things. And he'll love the shit out of everyone all the time. But if you fuck up, he's going to be dead serious in how you fucked up, how this impacts every one of us. I don't want to see that again. Fix it. And you're going to be very willing to accept that because most of the time he's awesome. He's hugging you. He's loving you. Um, so that's really key. You know, accepting feedback and giving feedback is there's a huge art to that. And that you can't just walk in on day one and do that. You got to build relationships. So that, that's why I like, you know, when, when I'm able to work with a team or an organization, because, hey, you're coming in for a week or a month or something like that. OK, because now I could do something. But no one wants to see a guy they just met and be like, yo, you should do this. That's never going to happen. We're just going to joke around and build relationships, get to know your background, whatever. Once you have a relationship, that's totally different. So now let's say we've established that relationship. We're good at that. We've, we've, we've read how to win friends and influence people and done all the things. Now we, we pull Michael Jordan aside or whoever it might be, the Michael Jordan of, of that organization and say, you know, dude, here's the thing. Like everybody has, I, I think everyone should read the five love languages because it's good for teams, not just like, Everyone receives feedback differently. Everyone gives feedback differently. Everyone receives love differently. And so if you and I are on the same basketball team or we're in the same organization, I need to know it's still love. Like I, I got, we got, we love each other. We were, you know, we're, we're trying to work for the same thing. So how do you receive love and feedback and all these things? It, it's, it's really nuanced and, and you just got to get good at that. Like you can't just expect that if, I, if I'm the black mom, but everyone's going to respond to me freaking out and yelling at them. That's not always the case. Some people do really well being challenged. Some people be, do really well with just more, you know, softer, constructive feedback. It's, it's so hard to give an answer, but it, it's, you know, just uh, trying to have, trying to teach those people empathy and like, and praise them. Like, dude, you're the best, but not everyone's at that level. And here's how it impacts us when you do that. Like, can you, can you, when you, when you go to Mike and yell at him, he doesn't respond that way. Jeff responds great to that. Mm -hmm. Mike needs to be caught a little more, you know, and I, and, and I look at you as the leader. Can you do this for me? Can you say to Jeff, Hey man, he, you know, like just things like that. It's just, it's just people skills. You know, it's really, I think that's the most important thing. If people just don't develop their people skills and their, their, their uh, relationship building skills enough. Yeah. I think that that's, it's so interesting because I, it's like you said, it's so nuanced and the strongest of leaders can have, you know, say you have seven direct reports, you, your approach, you might have seven, seven different approaches for each individual. Yeah. And it's going to take a really long time to understand each of those. And exactly like you're saying, I think it's probably heavily within the skill of listening. I've been, yeah. I've been studying listening a lot recently and you know, for example, like doing a podcast, when I first started podcasting, I would always get so nervous and I would always have like a list of questions and, you know, I would ask a question and then the answer would be coming through, but I'd be looking at the next question and I wasn't actually hearing right. what the person was saying. And so that was poor listening and it inter it didn't, the conversation one wouldn't flow how it could it wouldn't be the quality of conversation that it actually could be because I was trying to stick to a structure partially I was nervous and then I and then, then I wasn't listening but like it requires the listening of other individuals to understand exactly how they rank their needs or the way that in which that they feel loved like you can ask questions to then understand what gives that person the feeling of being seen, heard and understood. And it's so nuanced. I think that, that I think that that's what's, um, I think that that's what's interesting is like, if we go back to the self-development and self-help and like most of the time when we're studying something, we're looking for this one answer. 
And yeah. it's just like nutrition, movement, routine. It's going to be different for every single person. And like yourself, it requires patience, listening, relationship development to build the skill to connect with that one person. And it's going to be different with almost every other person. But I thought it was really interesting because I think it's listening builds trust, builds connection, builds understanding. And then there's this like custom approach for everything you do. And that's yeah. like a strong leadership skill. Yeah. And I think people need to get better at giving more positive feedback because normally what do we are constructive feedback, constructive criticism. It's well, if that's all, if you've never said anything to someone for six months and the first time you're talking to them is like, oh, you did a shit job on this. They don't really want to hear that. So you need to get, I think everyone needs to get better at just giving compliments, giving positive feedback when you're doing something well. And, and honestly, that's, I think there's studies showing that that's why a lot of times people will leave companies because they never got any feedback. And it wasn't that they no, like maybe nobody ever yelled at them, said a negative word to them, but nobody ever said, you're doing a good job. The way you do X, Y, Z is great. And it might be perfect, but if they don't know that, sometimes people are just like, oh, I'm confused. I don't know if I'm doing a good job. Like, so people need clarity. Like as a leader, you need clarity and you need to be able to project that clarity and speak with clarity and give people uh, what the mission is. Like, here's what I want you to do. And, you know, just simple and clear is super important. Yeah. Back to uh, what you were saying in evaluating what it is you don't want to happen, kind of the, or what you don't want to not exist. As you said, like, I don't want to not be able to laugh. Hmm. Uh, the concept of developing values or core values and, and operating principles I've had individuals ask, how do I do that? And I think that you spoke to that very clearly. It was, you need to understand what it is in your life that if you didn't have it, you would not be happy or, you know, how you phrased it, the things that you don't not want to happen. That tells you what you value. And a lot of the times that can be a lot shorter list, as you said. Yeah. But I know that what I have realized is, over the last several years, because I told you at one point, I was like, dude, we're not, Kurt's not doing too well right now. And it was on me to be a better leader. It was on me to speak clearly to a mission and simplify everything through. These are our values and this is why we've established those. But you can get so lost in yeah. complexity that you forget that. But if you get back to why you started and what you value, that should guide every decision that you make. And I think that that's really powerful from what you're saying is like, it sounds like, you know, you, you instill in individuals the power that they have within themselves to recognize what it is they value and guide your life that way. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. It's, it's an interesting road. <laughs> what are you most excited about right now, man? How, what's, what's your training in nutrition? Like, I always love to talk to you about this. Um, what is my training in nutrition like? So again, back to what I said earlier, I keep it pretty simple. I eat the same things over and over again. So I'll, I'll have, um, uh, I get up in the morning, uh, black coffee. It, I, I have found that if I go too long and have too much coffee, then it just sends me down this whole spiral of too much adrenaline and cortisol all day. Then my hands and feet are freezing. So I'll have coffee. I'll eat. I basically have bison and veggies and avocado and some blueberries. Like that's my breakfast every day. Uh, I'll have a similar, if I train, I'll have basically that same meal with either some sweet potatoes or rice. Um, most days I'll eat four times. So it'll be a very super similar meal. Uh, uh, if not, if it's after training, I'll have, um, I'll have whey protein and either some rice or I might throw whey protein and some cereal and then, uh, whatever Jen makes at dinner if we're going out, but it's, it's very similar. It's either steak, chicken or fish and rice veggies or uh, yams i i like to keep it super simple same thing over and over again do you ch do you uh change like physical goals and pursuits or are you at a place where similar to nutrition you've established the way in which you want to move your body um i'm curious as to the ability to continue to push yourself and sometimes you know hey, there's a physical pursuit. I'm going to do this competition or I'm going to do that, this, whatever. 
Uh, I'm, I'm always trying to get stronger. I'm always trying to, especially as I, I've gotten older. And in 2020, man, from all the sitting and being home, like I, for, for so many years, I was like, I don't know. I, I feel great. And then all of a sudden, the things you hear guys at my age, like, oh, my back, my hips, my knees, you know, things like that. Uh, I think just from sitting so much and everything and, and not having built that practice in as much because I was like, oh, I'm getting away with it. You know, I'm training full range, strength training. It's fine. I'm not stiff. But then I got really sick. So now I'm really focused more on mobility, feeling better, moving well. Um, you know, of course, you always want to look like The Rock, but that's not really my, my Dude, number one thing. Shredded, <laughs> man. You, every time I'm like, holy shit, if I can look like that for the rest of my life, I, I'm doing well. So I think a lot of people look at you like that. <laughs> uh, what's so uh, I, yeah, I, I generally, uh, these days I've been training pretty much upper lower four days a week. Um, or I'll do upper, lower, full, full stuff like that. Uh, I, I mix it up. How about just cardiovascular? I will go like, like today I'm going to go to, uh, today I'm not lifting. So I'm actually going to be near anatomy. So I'm going to stop in there. My, my friend Mike and I will do 30 minutes on, uh, I'll mix it up. Like I'll do the rower, the sled, the assault bike, uh, the skier, uh, and that's going to be a low intensity day. So I'll try to do two, two low intensity days a week where I just use the Mapitone formula, keep my heart rate at 180 minus my age for 30 minutes. I can, if I do one thing, I'll get bored out of my mind and my hips and back will feel worse. So I'll just do like one to five minutes on each of those. Just continue for 30 minutes. Uh, and then we'll jump in the sauna for 30 minutes after that. So I'll do that twice a week for, uh, for conditioning stuff. Now, I used to love hill sprints, but I'm in Florida and there's no hills. So that's out. Uh, is that based on your sleep or do you schedule in those days? Um, I, you know, half and half. Uh, so some days if I feel like absolute shit and I had terrible sleep, like you, like you said there, that then I would say, I don't want to go heavy and, 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 you know, try to be setting PRs and all that, then I'll do a lower intensity. So I, I have some flexibility uh, based on that. But then it's also like, now that I'm here, I want to spend time with, with my really good friend, Mike, like I said. So if he can't do it, I'll be like, ah, fuck it, we'll just, we'll just lift today. Uh, it, it depends. Yeah. Yeah, cool. How about, how about business? Is business evolving? Or I know um, you as a coach is a strong foundation of, of everything that you do is it what, what does it look like for you right now is business evolving is are you where where are you at with business right now um things are good yeah I, i'm you know i think 2020 everybody of course had to make some changes had to pivot figure it out and then that led into me uh making some changes at the beginning of 2021 which i think I, I, I figured out like things weren't really well. And then I realized, oh, I wasn't prepared for them to go that well. Uh, meaning we didn't have, I thought we had all the systems in play. I thought we had uh, the people that we needed, but I didn't anticipate it going that well. So now I have to, you know, kind of figure that out and, and what I want to do move, moving forward. And I, I'm a big believer in always simplifying, simplifying, simplifying. I always reread essentialism and the one thing in the 20. And I just think, I think it's human nature, but I'm going to, you know, point to myself. I, like anybody else, can get, uh, I, I can reread those things and be good for 30 days, 60 days, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, you're saying yes to this, you're taking on too much of this, you're doing that, and you think, oh, maybe, you know, this guy's doing this, I could probably do that really well too, so you, I have to kind of check myself every 60 to 90 days, be like, what can we cut, what are the few things that I do well, uh, you know, who do I want to help, what do I want uh, my legacy to be, and, and what is overwhelming me, like, what do I what have I started to take on? And it's funny, like you would think after, man, I'm doing a business like 27 years now, you'd think you'd get it down to where it never happens. But, uh, you know, I'll get there a few times a year where like, oh, fuck, there's, there's too many things going on. I'm doing too much. I'm saying yes to too much. I'm spreading myself too thin. So you have to, you know, kind of, um, you know, just, just scale back and simplify a little bit now. So, so I think I'm in that, in that position now. One thing I'm really proud of is we, we had our first live event uh, in a year, a month or so ago in Austin. And everybody to a man said that was the best weekend of my life. That was the best live event I've ever been to. And I've been doing live events for 15 years on my own. And one, two people have been at them for 15 years. Not everyone, obviously, but they both said, wow, that was the best event ever. And uh, Scott, who's been with me a long time friend and client, he, he sent me a text. He goes, you know, I was, I was trying to explain to Chris, who was in, in our coaching group years ago, why it was so much better. And I pointed to this and this and this. I mean, like the laughter was off the charts. He pointed to all these things, but he goes, really, 
at the end of the day, what I realized it was Jay's ability to lead a group was just 10 X what it used to be. Mm. And that's really uh, what changed. And so, so that made me so happy and so proud, you know? Um, and I think that's just something that we, we all need, you know, going back to the beginning of this conversation, we need to make that choice and work on that every day and be more comfortable in our own skin and, uh, you know, address some of those insecurities, some of that baggage. We all have that shit from childhood, address that work on it, realize that it's, it's a, a lot of the things that you think people are going to be judging you for. Like if you choose to be a leader and step up and get on stage and do these things, no one's judging you. Like nobody cares. They, they want you to do that. That's inspiring. Like yeah. if I, if I knew, you know, if I'm sitting there next to you, Joe, and I knew historically you wouldn't do that. Maybe you're introverted and, and, and shy and quiet. And then all of a sudden you jump up like, Oh my God, that's amazing. Most people actually want you to succeed. They're inspired when you succeed. I think we think that people judge us because of, you know, trolls and haters online, but that's not real life. Like people want you to, to succeed and want you to step up. And, uh, and people, you know, Dan Kennedy years ago said that everybody's walking around with their umbilical cord out and looking for someone to plug it into. So mm. again, choose to be that person. Yeah. Um, so so I, I think that's, that's what's exciting is what I work on every day, you know, came to fruition. We had that event in Austin. Those guys came out from around the country. We're like, that was amazing. That was epic. And it really came down to, and, I, and I'll admit that, like once Scott said that, I said, yeah, that's hundred percent. Right. Like I was, I was at my all time greatest that weekend. And I felt it. I knew it. Like I knew I was on, you know? Yeah. And so, so that makes you happy. And, and I, I think if, if you're doing that and living that way, like whatever you decide to do with your business is going to go well, because you are uh, a leader, you're living authentically. You like who you are. And, uh, and that, that's, that's so powerful. Yeah. There's, you, there's, there's always like the small little things you got to figure out, like some of the business things like, oh, how do we do this? How do we market this? Like some of that stuff can drive you insane. And some of that stuff is always like you're just testing it. You're throwing shit against the wall and it doesn't work. Of course, correct. But I think the bigger thing is, you know, your people skills, your leadership skills, because then then anything's going to work out in the end. Foundational. Yeah. yeah. Are, did you say that you were doing a live event out here in Denver or are you were you just traveling? here? So we, we were going to. Uh, we have our next one in August and I was just having trouble uh, coordinating the gym and whatnot. And so that's why, like I said to myself, what do I always tell everybody? How would this look if it was simple? How could we make this as simple and easy as possible? And, and I always do my live events in uh, Seattle because Luca's got his gym there or LA or Austin. I use on it or Miami. So the, uh, those are basically the four places where I have close friends and a gym. And I was trying to talk to people I don't know. And it was like, what am I doing? We're just going to do it in Seattle where, and we know it's formulaic and Lucas there, you know, so, so now, now we're doing it in Seattle. Cool. 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 Yeah. cool. Well, how do people find out more about that? Your, your next events, more about you get connected with you. I appreciate, I, I have to say like, before you even answer that again, like I always want you to know how much I appreciate you, how you've looked to me and supported me and believed in me since we met way back in the beginning of Cured. So thank you for that. Um, seems like that was like 20 years ago <laughs> so long ago right I know it does I don't even know how long it's like five years ago maybe seems like a long time yeah we've had some serious serious ups and downs since then but I appreciate you as always Jay and uh how do, how do people find out more about the events coming up find out more about you and uh you know we'll link to everything here through the cured podcast but just want to give you some time for anything exciting coming up including the live events yeah, um, uh, you can follow, uh, well, j.fit will send you to my website, uh, and then uh, Renegade Radio Podcast, uh, Instagram is at jferugia, that's it, and find out all, all the stuff there. Cool stuff. Well, yeah. thanks, brother, wishing you the best in Miami with your new adventures, and uh, look forward to continuing to watch you be somebody that I look to for leadership and business development skills, and thank you as always, man. Thanks so much, man, I appreciate it.